Hello and welcome to another edition of Turned Out of Punk. I'm your host, Damien Abraham. And once again, I'm bringing you a conversation with someone who grew up listening to punk, may or may not still be involved with punk, but had the life changed by the genre in a major way. And today on the show, not one, not two, but three of the greatest songwriters ever who go figure happen to play in one of the greatest bands of all time from the clean Robert Scott, David Kilgar and Hamish Kilgar are here on the show. And this, this is a good one. More on that in one second. But first, if you would like to get in touch with me, head over to the email address turned at a punk podcast at gmail.com. That is run by my brother, who is the show producer and guest booker extraordinaire of this podcast. Thank you, Tristan, for all your hard work. And he will get the message to me. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram at Left for Damien. And if you want to support the show, the best way to support the show is by telling all your friends about this podcast. You can also support the podcast by heading over to where you listen to this thing and reviewing it and rating it. Thank you to everyone that does do that. You can also support this podcast by going to turnedoutapunk.com and picking up a t-shirt. Uh, once again, thank you to everyone who has picked up one of those t-shirts. Or by going over to patreon.com slash turnedoutapunk. And once again, huge thank you to people that do do that. And check out some of the footnotes that go up there or uh, video versions of the podcast or lost episodes and whatnot. So once again, huge thank you to everyone that does support this thing because it does... Help it keep going. But speaking of support, this thing would not be possible with the kind support of the fine folks at Vans who said to me a few years ago, Damien, why do you do this thing out of your own pocket? Let, let us cover the cost of doing this thing. And uh, they helped me cover the costs, which there are some with a free podcast, which is, I know, very shocking, but it was shocking to me. But it is appreciated that they helped me cover those things on this thing here. I also play in a band called Fucked Up. We've got a bunch of records that have just been uh, reissued or are coming out. David Comes to Life, 10th Anniversary on Matador Records. Epics and Minutes is finally coming out on vinyl, which is our early singles collection on the great Get Better Records. And also Tank Crimes Records has put out our hour and a half long song, Year of the Horse. You can find out more information at fuckedup.cc or on those labels websites. We're also theoretically going on tour, but uh, yeah, we'll see what happens with that. But pick up tickets in the meantime, because they will be honored when it gets rescheduled, if it has to be rescheduled. You know, <laughs> that's all you can do. Just keep plugging along. Speaking of plugging along, let's move on to the show. Much more pleasant things to talk about. Today on the show, I know I laid on that hyperbole super thick off the top, but I was not... Without justification, today on the show, all three members of the clean on the absolutely essential Boodle, Boodle, Boodle EP, which is just being reissued by the, well, their, their, the record label that I'm on, Merge Records, because Merge has a great ear for music and has supported and put out Flying Nun bands for years and years and years, and this to me is music that somehow is still underrated. Now, this is, you know, ridiculous to people that are fans of this band because anyone that knows this band knows that they're one of the greatest bands of all time and they've been celebrated by everyone from Sonic Youth to Pavement to Yola Tango to everyone. Everyone, everyone who's heard this band becomes a fan. Not only not everyone, but mo most people and champion this band, but yet, to me, they are not really appreciated on the level they, they should be for their influence, because this band just changed everything. You know, anyone that kind of heard them, I think it altered the way they approached music. It certainly did the way I approach music, and, you know, the stuff that would kind of come in its wake with the Dunedin sound and Flying Nun Records and all these amazing discographies that these three people in this band have post the clean, or I guess kind of in the midst of the clean, in addition to the clean, including the bats, the unwashed, the weeds. There's, we could just go on listing records. These people have put out for the rest of the show and, and probably not even cover it all because that's how much incredible stuff they have been involved with. I, I could ramble on forever in this intro. So I'm just going to shut up now and let you listen to it. Because this is a this is a big one for me. Sit back, relax, and enjoy 
Robert, David, and Hamish on Turned Out a Punk. David, Hamish, and Robert, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you. As I was just letting you all know off air, this is a unbelievably huge thrill for me because like many people in this world, you know, discovering your band was like a, a watershed moment. And I think, you know, there are a few bands that have had kind of the, the long lasting impact on, for lack of a better term, independent music, punk music, like all sorts of music, underground music uh, than you guys. So this is a, a big one for us here at the show. Ooh, thanks. Hey, cool. I'm glad it's a watershed because we are the clean <laughs> and sometimes we use soap. Well, I tell you, we are we are definitely a bit of soap dodgers over here at Turned Out a Punk, but mm-hmm. I, we'll meet somewhere in the middle. Uh, right. I got to start this off the way they all start off, which is I'm going to ask you how you guys heard about punk music. But because there's three of you, I'm going to ask you guys to pick a number between one and ten. And I have written the number down right here on the sheet of paper in front of me, and that will decide who will go first. So, uh, David, if you could pick a number. Eight. And Hamish. Nine. And Robert. <laughs> Seven. All right. Well, Robert, you got the closest. The number was five. I would show you guys, but cameras are off. So just have to trust me on that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert, yeah. how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you ever came across the genre? Um, I think it was probably through listening uh, to a radio show um, that was on here in New Zealand in the late 70s. Um, hosted by Dr. Rock, and he was playing. Sorry, I was just running around outside. Um, <laughs> playing, playing various um, Running around the again? <laughs> yeah, I was running running to the car, and then I realised the data wasn't on, so, yeah, I came back into the gallery. Um, yeah, so he was playing lots of classic punk stuff, and I think that was the first time I would have heard it. And then, of course, um, listening to Hamish and David's record collection as well, so... I quickly um, fell in love with with that genre, just the the energy of it and the attitude. I think more than anything. Absolutely, and I imagine David and Hamish, your uh, starting points are are very much tied together. So, I don't know how did you guys first kind of come across punk? Well, um, for me, I'm older than David. I'm four and a half years older, but um, we shared a life together. I would describe myself as being a punk from the sixties. Because, um, you know, I heard the Stones, uh, the Stones and the Pretty Things toured here in New Zealand. And I had a cousin, an older cousin, he's four and a half years older than me. He was a mod in Christchurch. Okay. He said, you know, I was into the Stones as a kid, I heard them on the radio. And um, I said to John, you know, who's your, what do you think of the Rolling Stones? And he said, oh, they're okay, but all the mods in Christchurch like the Pretty Things better. And the Pretty Things did a tour in New Zealand in 65 in which the Prince was thrown out of the band for causing mayhem. He set fire to the um, New Plymouth uh, Theatre curtains. Um, he was on the front cover of The Truth, which is a New Zealand magazine uh, newspaper, and it had the animal um, falling asleep in airports, you know, just causing mayhem. So that occurred, but also, you know, we were into, I was into psychedelic music and um, used to buy... Uh, $2 records in the country supermarket. And you'd, you know, listen to things like um, Fire by Arthur Brown, Jimi Hendrix, you know, whatever, whatever. Uh, I heard Lou Reed in 1973, Transformer. I was transfixed. I was big on David Bowie, T Rex, Martha Hoople, you know, you name it, all the glam stuff. Then um, in 1975, I dyed my hair blonde and cut it off and wore a ring because Lou Reed did that. Uh, in 1976, I was hitchhiking through New Zealand with my cousin, and I heard the Modern Lovers Roadrunner on a cafe um, sound system in Nelson. So I was also an avid Any Me um, reader. I was big on the Stones on Excellent Main Street, and um, I was aware also of 50s music. I was obsessed with things like Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley. I saw Chuck Berry in Dunedin in 1973 with a New Zealand Dunedin band backing him up. Um, I saw things like uh, Sonny Terry and Brownie McGee, um, Canned Heat, Joe Cocker, um, all this sort of stuff. So 
basically, I was waiting for punk to happen. And when it happened, um, I was aware of it immediately. Um, before we got the records in New Zealand, we had a store in uh, Dunedin called Eureka, Jeff Rustin. So he was bringing stuff, you know, like the Flaming Groovies, all this stuff, which was almost the predating, you know, punk. Um, a guy called Al Park in Christchurch said, hey, I've just got this record from the States. It's Ramones. It's the best thing I've ever heard. Um, and at the time, we were concurrently getting into things like Sid Barrett and all sorts of stuff. So a wide variety of things fed into it. So when punk happened and when the Sex Pistols broke, we were just ready for it. And um, David and I were both avid record collectors. Uh, we collected all sorts of esoteric stuff. Uh, Californian West Coast psychedelia, you know, like West Coast pop art experimental band, love, da 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 da, you know, all the sort of garage punk, um, the Nuggets album. So there it is. That's what happened for us. <laughs> On my mouth <laughs> and so, mine. <laughs> well, well, I would say all, all of the below, but also. And, above. <laughs> and now we're at the above. <laughs> I would say I first heard about it. I think it was in a really, it was like a gutter tabloid called The Truth Magazine. It was a, it was a weekly, I think, or a monthly. I can't remember. A weekly. You mentioned it before. I think I first read about uh, the Six Pistols and that and thought oh, I'll take a note of that. But it was later, there was a, a Kiwi uh, rock journalist, I think it's a, what it was called. Dylan uh, Tate. Dylan Tate. Yeah. He filmed the Six Pistols in front of Buckingham Palace, I think, after they'd signed the EMI contract. It was mm -hmm. one of the earliest mm -hmm. um, news broadcasts on the Six Pistols, I think. And then that was like, okay, that looks really interesting. <laughs> 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 hadn't, hadn't heard the music till that point, though. Yeah, it was later. What was like the precursor to punk in New Zealand, right? Like, obviously, there's, you know, uh, Dr. Feelgood in England or, or, you know, in Canada, we had uh, Teenage Head and stuff going just before punk. And there's all the stuff like proto-punk stuff in America. Was there any sort of proto-punk New Zealand thing happening? I would say things like the Luddy Dars. You know, yeah. there were, Luddy Dars had a song called, um, they did a cover of How, How's the Air Up There. And, um, in each town, each city, there was an R&B club scene, you know, and there were bands playing um, in the 60s into the 70s. So there were R&B bands, you know, there was uh, Al Park, who was part of the Christchurch scene. He was in a band called the Roadrunners, north of um, Wellington. So there was a lot of garage psych happening here, uh, which is really a, a precursor to that. Of course, you know, in the 70s, you had prog and you had hippies bands and jam space, bands. Space vaults. <laughs> space vaults were fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, John Lydon was awful about split ends. He said he hated them. But I tell you what, split ends, when I saw them in 75, were pretty fucking amazing. They're very proggy, but they were very experimental and strange. And they were on TV in 73 on this talent contest thing. And that's how they became known in New Zealand. And they grew from that. And um, there was you know, a very vibrant music scene here all through from the, from the 50s. I've got a drum kit sitting in the shop that I'm closing down, and it belonged to a 1950s Dunedin um, jazz band. It's an old 50s, um, you know, jazz kit. Hmm. So to say that sort of people tend to perceive New Zealand as being isolated and kind of away from the world, but Hey, look! All these bands came here in the six in the sixties. You know, we, the Honeycombs played here, and H Honey Langtree was said to be, have the foulest mouth of any woman they ever heard on the drums. You know, and um, <laughs> uh, the Walker Brothers came here, uh, the Stones, um, the New Beats. You know, all sorts of wacky stuff came through here, and the New Zealand bands played with them. You know, Mick Jagger was so cool in the sixties. He went and hung out at St Clair Beach with teenagers from high school and talked to them. And, you know, that sort of thing was going on. It's like everybody was interested in what was occurring and it was a revolution. Mm -hmm. So that, that continued into the 70s, you know. And in New Zealand, we were reading about the Sex Pistols and seeing photographs of them and the New Musical Express and the Melody Maker. But they got out to New Zealand by post three months later. So we were three months behind on what was happening, you know, there. But also... With this uh, record store in Dunedin, Eureka, uh, Jeff was bringing in New York Rocker magazines, uh, all the singles that were coming out both in LA and New York, and we were getting to hear it, you know, and 
it just blew my mind. You know, I heard the mumps, I like to be clean on single. And I thought, well, that's kind of a cool name for a band. And then there was a Hell's Angel in a movie called Sweet Ride, which had Moby Grape. And this Hell's Angel had a bald head and he was called Mr. Clean. And then I later found out that Mr. Clean is a thing in America. You know, it's a, a cleaning agent with a yeah. bald guy with a ring in his nose or whatever, you know. <laughs> so we were informed by all this, but we we're also informed locally. And Roger Shepard came to see me recently and had a, he said he wants to write another book. And he wants to write a book about cultural imperialism because he said, I said to him back in the back in the day when Flying Man was starting, he said, you know, we're, what's important is what's going on right here, right now. You know, that's the thing. And we're, that's what we're focused on. That's what all the bands in New Zealand were up to. Um, the Auckland punk scene, David, David and I were in that in 79 with the clean, playing with Toy Love. And um, it was just an incredibly vibrant scene with a lot going on and a lot of interchange of ideas Fashion the inner, and the enemy, whatever. the enemy. <laughs> yeah, don't forget the enemy. Nope. Well, uh, David, I read an interview with you actually, where you talked about how you were listening to the colored balls at the time of the interview. Like, how much awareness was there of of that kind of stuff in Australia that was happening, like Lobby Lloyd and colored balls, and and you know, like sort of once again the direct precursor to this stuff, like the heavy rock and roll. You know, I only just recently discovered that in recent years, actually, that that stuff. Um, how did I find out about that? Probably through Endless Boogie of all people. But um, Australian music, most of the Australian music we were getting in the 70s and 60s was just a rehash, really, um, of the hits. But, uh, there, this, you know, this course, the Saints were a wonderful band and they were influential. I don't know how they were, but they were. The, you know, mm. the Saints' first three LPs were fantastic. Mm. Yeah. And uh, Radio Birdman. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It's it's amazing, like, how there's this thing that's kind of happening like you, you know hamish you talked about it, how you, there's a bunch of people that are just waiting for this thing to hit you know at the time mm-hmm. and like you kind of see these little out poppings of stuff you know like you mentioned the flaming groovies like the nerves and and like all this stuff that's kind of happening in the dogs in detroit and and then of course radio birdman and the saints and stuff that's happened in england like it's amazing how there's a sort of like I don't know, like unconscious psychic energy that's going throughout the world where all these kids are are tapped into the same sort of thing. So when this thing hits, all these scenes are just kind of ready to explode internationally all at the same time. Yeah. I get this as a vignette too. Like I befriended Chris Knox and in 1975, I had my first acid trip and he was my guide. <laughs> and he said, you got to listen to the Stooges' first album, and then we'll follow that with the Velvet Underground first album, and then we'll follow that with, you know, uh, the Bonzo Duda band or something else, you know, and it's just like, oh, boy, okay. <laughs> this is kind of amazing, you know. I ain't never heard. I saw Raw Power sitting in record bins in 1973, but I didn't think, well, that guy's kind of weird. He looks a bit like David Bowie, but I didn't get to listen to the record until a bit later, you know. Mm-hmm. And the dolls also, I got them a little bit after, you know, they happened um, because I thought, God, they look like a bunch of poses looking, trying to look like the Rolling Stones. You know, how lame is that? <laughs> you know, little knowing that they were fucking fantastic when I heard them, you know. So, of course, of course, Chris's band, The Enemy, were, were a huge influence on the both of us, I think, as well. They yeah. were just, they were absolutely wonderful. Just from the word go, they were wonderful. Yeah. Although they only had five, five songs, they were just, so great, <laughs> and they're and they're the first, right? Like that's what I've always heard. They were the the very first. They were the punk. first Dunedin, and Dunedin, yeah. Because there's also that Gary Havoc and the Hurricanes, and there's like a bunch of sort of like once again, it's not I guess like proto tearaway stuff happening in Auckland too, right? At the same time, it yeah. seems it's but almost just it's almost post just post pub rock that stuff almost really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the first group were um, the Suburban Reptiles, and they put out a single, and they're also in a movie, you know, which was. On, they, were so, they were so generic, though. I mean, geez. yeah, but they had a billboard on, um, uh, you know, Buster Stiggs, the drummer, went on to play with um, the swingers. Sorry. But uh, there was also a band in Auckland called the Scavengers who had a, um, they were great. And I got to, I got to catch them in Auckland when they came back from Australia. They became the marching um, girls. And um, Brendan Perry went on to Dead Town Dance. There was also a band called Proud Scum, and there were other people, the Herco Pilots, and all these other mm-hmm. people doing things. And mm-hmm. uh, two women played in the clean, uh, Jamie Jetson and Debbie Lee. She went on to the Birdness Royce, but they were in an all-girl group called the Idol Idols, you know, which was in a kind of macho male scene. There was interesting stuff happening, you know, and um, 
There were artists and photographers floating around that scene. Some people looked like punks. Some were skinheads. Some were in new wave. And uh, you know, all- I, I, I always like to say that the punks were just the hippies of short hair, really. <laughs> mm-hmm. Same idea. Yeah. At the end of the day, same ideals, you know. And we picked up on the whole do-it-yourself thing, I think, more than anything from punk. That's what I got from it the most was go and do it yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what you guys do is, is you know, like create like a completely – new sound you know like it's it's something where like i think that's why so many people over here find it so fascinating is because it is something so different like from anything else that's happening at the same time like it's it's almost like this completely i don't know like it's a completely different take on the way things are going like you mentioned the diy thing it's like you guys are taking this energy and applying it to something completely new and completely different than you know other people that are just trying to ape, you know, the, the Ramones or the Sex Pistols or whatever else is happening yeah. at any given time. That's think- another, that's another thing that Punk gave me was, you know, you do your own thing, you know, you don't necessarily yeah. follow this, go out and do your own thing and do it yourself. And, you know, which is why we never had things like managers or all that stuff or publicists or that sort of thing, you know. So Yeah, yeah. I would say that we were uh, non-conformist and we didn't conform directly to trends. You know, David mentioned the uh, suburban reptiles being uh, kind of, you know, they were they ate, there were art school kids who, you know, dressed up in all the right gear and had the right haircuts. But um, for me, I guess what happened, especially with Chris and um, uh, Mike Dooley and Alec Bathgate, they're art, art students, you know, and Chris, when I met him, he was making, making films, Super 8 films, and he's also recording music. He had this crazy version of uh, Row, Row Your Boat Down the Stream that he recorded with Mick Dawson, who was the enemy's bass player. And uh, Mick was English. He'd been in London. He'd been involved in the skinhead scene uh, with reggae and music as well. And there was also a smattering of people in Christchurch who had English connections. Ollie was um, a dude who made guitars and played with the basket cases that Paul Keane, later the Bats, played with. And um, when we met them in Christchurch, we all had this kinship because they were playing uh, covers of psychedelic stuff but they're also making their own music and they were drawing on lots of threads and um, ideas but they weren't necessarily conforming to a defined um, you know conformist sort of idea of what punk should be or whatever and I, I always took from punk that it gave you license to do an experiment in any way possible and it, you know if you played an acoustic guitar that didn't make you happy um, if you did whatever you know if you boiled an electric jug on a dance floor and put a mic on it. Uh, that's interesting. You know, Paul <laughs> did that at a gig at the subway and, yeah, yeah. you know, um, so there's all that yeah. stuff happening. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause and that's what it is in the very beginning too. Like, you know, you look at all the bands that are kind of fitting under this umbrella at the very start of this thing. You know, it's only later on that things start getting really, you know, in other places, I mean, like really kind of codified and kind of like mm-hmm. the, the parameters are established on what is and what isn't. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Where'd you guys kind of go from, you know, hearing this sort of stuff in terms of like, like playing music? Like, were you already playing music by the time you had heard punk? As you said, you're waiting for this thing to happen. We'd both, like- dabbled. We'd both dabbled a little bit, but hadn't taken it seriously until punk came along, really. Yeah, yeah um, same, same for me. Yeah. It, it you know, also, we all had smatterings of learning instruments, you know. Um, I was forced but, to learn the recorder, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I can still and play I, tunes on that. <laughs> I started playing, learning to play the bagpipes. Um, <laughs> with the I remember that, yeah. And also, I thought the, the drums are way cooler, you know. What's the paradiddle? You the know? drone, man, the drone. Exactly. <laughs> I, I really dug bagpipe bands, you know, Highland bagpipe bands. And um, our mother also was a musician, a piano player, and she sang in show tunes and did, you know, she did shows and things. And she had an operatic voice, you know. I was, I've never been a Christian, but my mother used to like to take me to never church. Never been a Christian. <laughs> yeah. take, us to church. take me to church. And she'd make me stand in front of her and she'd sit and be behind me and she'd sing all the all the fucking, you know, um, songs, <laughs> the loudest. So she dominated the room and I'd just be there cringing, going, why are you doing this to me? Why she to be, this? Yeah, she always had to be the loudest, right? Yeah. yeah. She had Sounds to be the, familiar. Big voice. You know? <laughs> but um, I don't even think my mother was really a Christian. You know, she just like 
any opportunity to sing or do things. <laughs> she was also known, you know, she was known as a fast old girl in the country. They used to play all these country dances, you know, her and her sister piano play and sing and stuff, you know, and her cousins had a dance band. The first drum kit I ever played on, they had a, they actually had a country ballroom in their house and they had a drum kit set up in it, you know, and it was, this is the first kit I played on. I said, hey, what's this for? And it's like, oh, what parties we have, you know, they, they tour around playing, you know, and it was like, whoa, this is cool, you know. <laughs> How about you, Robert? Did you grow up with much music in your house? Um, yeah, I, I grew up, I grew up with a lot of music. My um, uh, mum's from England, dad was from Scotland and uh, they would sing um, Scottish and English folk songs around the piano. So that, that definitely informed my sort of early musicality. And then I learned um, trumpet and piano. And so I had a, on a, I don't know, probably a traditional um, background in music, for want of a better word. And as soon as I ran into th these two guys, I realised um, there was another kind of music that was really fun to make. And uh, it was an absolute blast working with with Hamish and David on on the early stuff when we were writing stuff. It was just the ideas were just coming out, and we we did whatever we wanted, and it was. It was incredible. Bob, I mean, Bob could play piano too. So, you know, when we discovered that, uh, that was great. <laughs> 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 you know, okay, there's an organ. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we could play the three piece with, uh, you know, 12 string, keyboards, organ, and yeah. drums. Yeah. You know, we could mix yeah. it up. And um, yeah, yeah. it was, it was, it was painful. Yeah. I think that's the Doors influence. We realized, shit, you don't need a bass. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, and it's funny because you also the the folk stuff and kind of like the more traditional music stuff, like even even church music, like that's something yeah, that yeah. comes across in in all your bands. Like you know, like not that they sound similar at all, but I mean, like there's is sort of this like not just return to sort of traditional rock and roll, but return to sort of traditional recordings almost. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think they do think, music. Yeah, build up, build up old folk music. I think also. Um, my mother and her family and myself, we're very eclectic about what we like, you know, like I'm, I've always been a world music person, you know, and um, I listen to a wide variety of music, you know, Bob, I know, classical well, Irish, music, yeah, well, Irish folk, Scottish, huh? yeah. the incredible oh, string band, yeah. you know, look at, look at that sort of amazing amalgam of tradition, but also pushing into the future. And um David and I were also huge Dylan freaks. Um, my cousin in Christchurch, you know, had Blonde on Blonde. And I listened to that. I heard Satanic Majesty's Request, which blew my mind in the 60s. Um, Neil Young's first album and all this sort of stuff. And we were just constantly being turned on to stuff. I have another cousin, John, who was also an avid record collector. And I would turn up and it's like, hey, what's the flavor of the month? You know, and it's Van Morrison's, you know, latest album or something. And I'm, then take that away and sort of digest it and then move on to something else like Roxy Music or whatever and Eno and... Just kept coming. <laughs> <laughs> it just keeps coming. Yeah, yeah. Of... and it still keeps yeah. coming, you know. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we're, we... we're like... Sorry, go on. No, you go on. <laughs> uh, I was I just going to say, were, were the Buzzcocks like... an influence at all too? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. All that stuff. Yeah. The Buzzcocks are massive a massive influence you know i've seen them uh, a lot in the uh, before pete shelley died in, in um i saw the uh, reunion show in new york city in um 89 or whatever 88 and um they were just amazing because they had the original drummer and um the whole crowd and the, the audience uh they played the ramones you know pet cemetery and everybody was singing along and cheering <laughs> you know it was just <laughs> so fucking cool that's awesome yeah. um because yeah like I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that there was at, very early on right there was a pressing plant in new zealand and that's one of the few punk records that actually got like a domestic new zealand pressing i think mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's, yeah. possi that's possible yeah. so, yeah. was a lot of stuff was, a lot of stuff a lot of stuff was imported still back then but also a lot of stuff was made here as well like pressed and printed yeah. here yeah you're right the first buzz cox album didn't come in Came in on import, and then uh, oh, things oh, like yeah. uh, "Singles Going Steady" and later ones were released. Singles, yeah, that, that was released here on yeah. yeah. "Singles Going yeah. Steady" New Zealand released. But I yeah, was they were, they were, they were like, huge. They were huge influence on me at the time, songwriting wise. Same as the Ramones were. You know that whole three chord idea of you could write a pop song with three chords. You know, 
We were also big on magazine too. Uh, how Devoto was. Sure. Know, all that stuff. All this and Wire. Wire. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Like a little more on the obscure side. What about a band like the Desperate Bicycles? Like they were a band that championed DIY and also very much per- pushed sort of acoustic mm-hmm. uh, approaches to punk rock. I've never heard of them. It's, it's, I, I, stuff I, I have, I know who you're talking about, but I tell you who was an even bigger influence on me because well, I met Yeah, but also television personalities. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I, I've hung out, I know Jar Head really well, he's a good old friend. And um, television personalities, we brought them over to uh, the States for the first time and toured with them. And it was the most insane tour that I've ever been on. <laughs> um, we had a we had an old Oldsmobile custom cruiser in New York that had been given to us by... Uh, <laughs> I remember that. And, um, we we you know, picked them up at the airport. Now, this is... Okay, I don't mind this because I don't think Jeffrey will mind it, but the television personality turned up at, you know, Kennedy. And I'm in the you know, Oldsmobile custom cruiser. Jeffrey, the drummer, comes out and he has on a big ring and he undoes the ring. He says, oh, look, lovely. And it's got a huge block of hash in the ring. Oh, great. <laughs> so this is the beginning of the tour. It's straight out of customs. Bang. You know, we're in it. okay. So we're heading up to Boston and um, everybody goes into McDonald's to get some food. And I'm sitting in the van with, um, you know, I'm in the car, but the Oldsmobile. And I noticed the heat, you know, it's gone out. It's really hot, uh, the car. So I go and take the uh, radiator cap off and literally a 20 foot of steam just went up in the air. And Dan's sitting there just, you know, will look a horror on his face, Dan Tracy. And I say, Dan, don't worry, Dan, it'll be all right. It's like, cool, don't worry, <laughs> you know, no problem. And the, the steam goes down, everybody comes back from McDonald's, no one knows what happened and we just drive off. But this car breaks down. I remember that, I remember that car. You left that fucking car <laughs> with me and Noel we drove around in Manhattan in that fucking thing in the middle of summer. It was yeah, I know, and it broke down. Complete fucking insanity. Yeah. <laughs> but but in DC. Surrounded by junkies, you know. Hey, do you I want know, some I junk? know. Yeah. The guy anyway. was covered in, um, you told me <laughs> the guy covered in soap, uh, soap solution. Yeah. He just had jeans on and nothing else and covered in soap, yeah. lacquered soap. Back, back <laughs> in the day in New yeah. York City, if you tried to get into a club, You'd have these guys run up to you, African American, and saying, "We'll help you with the guitar. We'll help you." It's like, <laughs> <laughs> run! No, we don't want help because they just run off down the road with it. <laughs> Here's the story about the automobile in DC. We broke down on the way to the club. The, uh, I can't remember the ten o'clock club or the nine o'clock. Nine thirty. And the yeah, nine thirty, and the worst ghetto in DC. <laughs> so the car breaks down, and we haven't got to the club. Later, after the gig, we go back and pick up the. The car and someone says, I got a great idea. We'll just push you all the way to where you're staying tonight. <laughs> Push, shunted all the way through DC to the other side to where we were staying, you know, wow. and the way the tour rolled. <laughs> it was, wow. you know, <laughs> makes clean tours look like a, a picnic, 10 days picnic. <laughs> anyway. Where was the yeah. first where was the first place you guys went to in terms of touring? Uh, <laughs> overseas, overseas, you're talking about. Yeah, but I, I think, I mean, uh, America. Outside, yeah, America. Yeah, oh, America, right? Australia, Australia. Did no, America. The first gig we did together as the claim was London. Overseas. Oh, yes, that's right. Oh, yeah. 88. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. That was the first overseas gig, 88. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You you hadn't gone to Australia before. I guess like that's the thing. And there's such a misconception, I think, in this part of the world about how close things are over there, even in terms of within the country. We stopped for about we stopped for about five years though. We had a big break. Yeah, and also we didn't have a name in Australia. You know, we were underground, Hmm. and um, you know, Toy Love had gone over there and suffered horribly because (laughs) he couldn't really break into a very it's a very pub rock orientated scene back in that back in that period. You know. The go-betweens and the saints and various other people came out of that, you know, Ed Cooper and all that sort of thing. But it was a small scene within Sydney, like a few pubs you could play at in Melbourne. And, you know, the go-betweens probably played in one bar in Brisbane. But um, for a New Zealand band to go over there, there was this whole hard rocking, very machismo sort of Aussie rock scene, you know. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. we would... If we'd gone there, we would have played to maybe ten people in a bar in Melbourne. You know, there was, there was like always that. that un, there was always that underlying thing. Oh, the Kiwi band. Yeah, 
yeah. oh, the Kiwis are here. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mate. Yeah, what's it like? What's it like? You've got to get on your shoulder. Get down. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. it's, it's, it's a bit like the Canadian, uh, Canadians hate Americans, right? So it's, well, it's, it's, it's the same. I think it's the same <laughs> cultural relationship, exactly, between yeah. the two yeah. countries, I find. Mm-hmm. And, but, I, you know, I think and what you say is very true about the music, like, it's all you know, like this sort of hard driving blues rock post, especially post ACDC where, you know, a lot of the punk has that kind of running throughout it, which just feels, yeah, very much at odds with the approach that you guys are taking. And ultimately a lot of bands, not every band, obviously, but a lot of bands from Dunedin and, and, you know, I guess Christchurch a little bit too. Yeah. Well, uh, every, every city had an interesting subcult thing going on you know wellington had an interesting very uh progressive scene there's an ep called the four stars ep with a bunch of oh yeah wellington you know in in wellington in 1981 we had a uh, show closed down by the riot police because it was during the spring box door period um also the cure what happened was that after this gig got closed down by the cops um and there were gang members there maori gang members so it was a very heavy socio-political scene we went and played at a thing there were these things called terrace parties where they had these big houses and it was like it's a house party you know so mm. everybody said okay come back to the terrace and we played to a, everybody that couldn't you know got kicked out of the uh, venue and other people too and it was a huge party but get this the cure when they played wellington was so cool they went and played a uh, house party on the terrace <laughs> and everybody in the scene said the cure the coolest band because they came and played a house party, you know, after their gig mm. at the town hall, you know. So yeah, that sort of atmosphere. Um, there was there were people doing very experimental, esoteric, strange music, you know, very, I don't know, it was beyond post punk. Uh, George Henderson was mixed up with a band called the N Band, and there was other bands. It was the Vacuum in Christchurch, and there were people in Auckland too doing very strange and wonderful things. But it was all very underground, you know. There was bands called Choose the Tide. We had some great old experimental bands from the '60s as well, as well. Mm-hmm. Though you know, we really did some great psychedelic bands. Yeah, Billy TK and um, you know, a bunch of people were doing stuff. Uh, it also feels like very much from the beginning, it's it's tied into like uh, a heavy art scene too. There's a lot of people that would go mm-hmm. on to, of course, massive success as artists and stuff tied into the scene. And it feels like it, it, it's like. Uh, like as as much as it is sort of like a rock and roll driven scene, it's also very much an arts driven kind of scene. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I totally agree yeah. with that. And um, it's, it's quite a common. It's quite a it's common, like New York, co- like LA, you know, yeah. common yeah. thread, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Well, I think that's the thing about punk rock, right? Like it, at, at its core, it's street rock and roll meets art school, and that's what absolutely that's mm-hmm. how it comes yeah. together. Yeah, a way of doing things. Yeah, it's a style. It, it's funny when I went to. I was in Auckland. I went to a record store and I was like looking around the record store and I was, uh, the guy's like, what kind of stuff are you looking for? I'm like, Oh, New Zealand punk stuff. I'm looking for, you know, flying nun stuff. He's like, Oh, I don't, I don't like that stuff. And I'm like, Oh yeah. He's like, yeah, I played in a, I played in a punk band back in the day. And, and that stuff was very much like not part of my scene. It was very almost like adversarial, his relationship mm-hmm. to, to stuff. And I, I was wondering if is that something that you guys encountered at the time? Was there like a, a division of people that wanted to kind of like do a much more traditional approach to punk rock. Cause like on that AK 79 comp, all different styles are kind of being reflected. Yeah. The I, think that, I think that to me, that just sounds like a classic high fidelity scene, <laughs> yeah. of, you know, really. I mean, every well, store's got, every store's got one, right? Like a fuck that music, man. What are you even talking to me for? I, mean, <laughs> I understand yeah. that. You know, people get it rammed well, down their throat here. The whole reading it's, sound thing. It's not sounds, really about being sounds, sounds, John. Sounds. Sounds. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and people, 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 <laughs> I was say, in Auckland in 79, there were, there were skinheads, you know, and the skinheads were obnoxious and they tied themselves to proud scum. And there mm. were, you know, skinhead girls too, you know, uh, boot boys and boot girls. And the whole scene got really violent. Apparently, I was at a, at a club with Toy Love and Toy Love were kind of, you know, championed by the, all the skinheads and all the punks. But all these skinheads were menacing behind me. They were about to beat me up. And then Chris Knox walked up and talked to me and then they said, oh, He's okay. Like he's got long hair, but now we won't kill him, you know. And the, one of the first parties I went to in Auckland was skinheads chasing somebody around the lawn saying, let's kill him, you know. It was so violent. The scene in Auckland was so violent too. And then later you had 
skinhead sort of hardcore punk things like happening in Christchurch. There was a band called Desperate Measures who still exists today. And there were divisions where we, we would be perceived as sort of being art school, sort of, you know, Nancy boy, sort of, uh, you know, freak folk. Nancy boy. Psychedelic <laughs> punk and not really a punk. You know. But, you know, we had some skinheads break into a house and they took all the stuff, a lot of records, and um, about a week later they found out it was our stuff or my stuff and I was in the clean. They bought half of it back. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and then we got drunk with them as a thanks. And then <laughs> one of the one of the women with them went and stole all his Genevieve's jewellery. Oh, <laughs> oh, the good old days. Yeah. Wow, I was going to say membership has its has its privileges, but apparently not. You get um, take, give and take. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's like a double whammy that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like it's it's something that's you hear time and time again. Like there is always this, like we met, like I was just saying, like the street rock and roll meets art school thing. Like there is definitely a divide where where people take it up so much, and it seems like that skinhead thing almost is an extension of the violence that that I, I forget what they what they're called but shane carter talks about them in his book but like almost like the the gearhead guys that would have been around and would have just beaten up yeah, people at parties and stuff funny, it's sort of like subcult stuff you know because it's also it can be quite classist if you look at it you know in social class because but the there's always haters out there as well right there's always haters yeah, around but the people that that stuff. you know gravitated to the sort of uh skinhead hardcore scene we're often working class you know and disenfranchised on the doll um a lot of the people in the flying nun scene were middle class you know people who went to university or the art school dropouts or whatever you know sit around sort of debating you know contemporary feminist thought or whatever where the working class sort of punk skinhead thing was it was very uh hardcore it was often drug orientated as well and it was about making a statement, you know, having a leather jacket with studs with your favorite band on the back of it, you know, an anarchy mm. sign or whatever. But it, again, it became, it was like very uniform. We would look at it and think, well, these, they're just or aping a, a sort of like a, a sort of style that isn't really something they're actually making themselves. Um, mm. They're actually it's adopting this obvious. sort of form from the fucking UK. And it's sort of like, okay, you've got your, you know, mullet and you've, you know, <laughs> here or whatever, and your fucking leather jackets and your boots, and you walk around being tough and beating up people and breaking bottles. But, you know, what are you, what are you actually thinking cool, about cool, cool. socially, or what are you? If you're an anarchist, what are you actually doing? Are you at the barricades? You know, fighting the cops? Oh, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, so there's all that, and then. Also, within the scene in New Zealand, we existed, there was a elitist sort of rock thing. You know, there's a, a guy called Dave Dobbin and the Dudes, and, you know, they had a song called... Um, hey, Dave's a friend of mine, easy. He's a Christian. But get this. Oh, we're, so? on, we're on tour with a friend Oh, watch. no. He's yeah, not a yeah. Christian. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's allowed. Friend. He's allowed. He, he's allowed. He's allowed, but, you know, <laughs> we, were, we were touring with yeah, the Great yeah. Wasp with a generator in the back of an Austin Maxi. We had two Maxis on tour with Peter Gutter and <laughs> David Amasso. And we went around New Zealand in 84, you know, in these Maxis. And we would... been crazy. <laughs> we could play all sorts of weird places, but we could play on the street and we could play in band shells, you know, and do something before the cops showed up. So we were in somewhere like Palmerston North or uh, somewhere in the North Island, and one of the Maxis had broken down. One of the dudes the comes... Bl- it was the bass player, the that's right. In the sports car, part? and he just looks at us and he goes, "Poor bastards." <laughs> <laughs> he was fucking right, wasn't he? He yeah. was right. <laughs> the the big chick. She said, "Poor mad bastards." <laughs> well, my mother, my mother used to go back in the eighties. She said, "I'm still waiting on the Maserati boys." Where is <laughs> oh, I thought it was an MG. Hang on, it was an MG. No one said nothing about a fucking Maserati. <laughs> I want a Maserati. <laughs> well, if you guys so could, if you could buy a Maserati with indie accolades, you guys would have a <laughs> whole fleet of them. <laughs> oh yeah, I like you. You're a poet, and you know it. <laughs> I want some accolades. Um, was that time that you guys are kind of like doing that tour? Like, is that a function of the fact that there's nowhere to play, or or is that just because you want to bring your music to as many people as possible in places that you know you couldn't play otherwise? 
as an alternative to pubs, basically. Yeah. 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 Mainly. And, avoid all that. Um, there's, there's a guy called David Merritt. He's kind of a brilliant dude. He's a poet. Complete maniac as well. Uh, on that tour, he'd lost all their um, money, left a suitcase at a hall because there were a lot of undesirable people there. But Dave, um, in Auckland, he was a, a co-manager of a cabal that managed, looked after Screaming Mimi's, Blam Blam Blam, and um, who's the other pneumatics. pneumatics? Pneumatics or the regulators? Yeah, yeah. yeah and with Paul like Rose, they had this joint management thing, and they were. Very cool. Dave's an old socialist from an old English socialist family. So he booked this tour, you know, completely by himself with a telephone. Um, the idea was just to get out into all the wop wops, all the places, you know, in the summertime that where we could take what we were doing. And we were, I can remember we played in um, uh, we were, uh, we were Napier harsh. at a youth club. <laughs> so we get to the youth club and there's all these young people there. And they're playing um, New Order's Blue Monday. <laughs> Everybody in the club is up dancing to Blue Monday. We go up and start playing. Everybody sits down <laughs> and watches this <laughs> silence. Then they put Blue we Monday. Were harsh, though. And Fuck, we were everybody so harsh. Up and dances again to Blue Monday. Then we play again. <laughs> everybody <laughs> sits down. <laughs> That's what it's like. <laughs> you know. I think they just end up coming over. Here's your money. You can go now. <laughs> oh, yeah. But. They got to go out and dance to, you know, some cool... We were so stuff. fucking harsh. So what the hell were we doing there at a youth club thing? You know, it's the great and wild. But it was, that was the cool thing about Dave was that <laughs> he would say, let's go and do this thing because these kids have never heard this before. They've never heard a three-piece with two guitars and drums playing this demented sort of rockabilly, you know. Um, and uh, it was exposing was it, people to stuff. And I think that's what's interesting wasn't Mike, about... Wasn't Mike more than me? Well, sorry, go on. No, no, that's it. Go on. <laughs> uh, David, you I'm want to? At, I'm good at stopping short. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was going to ask, though, was that around the time you guys start Clino Records, too, and do your own, the Oddities tape, right? That was just a fantasy label, really. I don't think that actually existed as a label. We, we did that through Flying Nun. I was working at Flying it's partly, Nun. It's partly trying to claim ownership of the Masters even back then, I think. <laughs> 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 Well, we that um, uh, Oddities cassette had actually been released in Holland by a friend before yeah. we even signed up Flying Nun. Oh, um, yeah. David titled it Left by Soft, which was a title of one of his songs on the um, cassette. And we put What's that it? out and we, we recorded that on a B77. And, um, and David had actually done a lot of stuff just by himself, which was interesting too, you know, like we didn't even play on it. It was, it was David doodling on a B77 right. with guitar and, you know. I worked out how to overdub on a two-track by bouncing down, basic thing that you do, so. Well, we, we, we all, we did that. That was, we kind of empowered ourselves and we actually inspired Chris Knox and Alec to go back, Chris reporters. He came to Dunedin, we were recording in a church, a church hall associated with the university. Somebody gave us free access and we basically recorded a lot of oddities, all the clean tracks in this hall. Chris and Alec came and visited us and they were thinking about doing the first tall door stuff and mm. they bought a four track and then that began the whole four track thing. You know, I later had a four track and we did the um, Grand and Washed album on that. We sold the B77 because we thought we we're going to be moving <laughs> on to different things, you know, and it, what, what we moved on to was recording with a four track. Later then we got into... I got, I got a good story. I got a good story about that Revox. You know, I decided, fuck, or one of us decided we need a Revox because the Rolling Stones first album was recorded on a Revox two track. <laughs> okay. And I said, well, that album sounds fucking amazing. Yeah, let's go one of those. We walk into our local music store and say, hey, we're we looking for a Revox two track. And he said, well, you just look, I tell you what, this guy owes me some money. You just go around to his house. He won't be there. Knock on the door. He's never there. Go on and take the two track and take it home and you can start buying it off me. So we did that. We went around this guy's house, walked into his house, picked up the two track and took it home. <laughs> it's a true story. Wow. Wow. That is awesome. I've never heard that before. <laughs> How did you make connections with this guy in the Netherlands that does the first tape? Well, um, what happened was, you know, people that are in the Dunedin scene in the late yeah, 70s. Ginny, Ginny Bell, was it? Yeah, they all went overseas and um, yeah. went to London and stuff. So they're all music freaks. And um, Jenny was uh, Dutch Lebanese and she had, she lived in um, Holland for a bit, you know, so she befriended people in Amsterdam. 
and they were music fans. And then she said, hey, you know, my friend will put out the cassette, you know, so we put out the cassette. I think David's still got a thing called the Clean Book, um, which sort of documents our story. And, you know, at the front of the Clean Book is a, a cassette label, which is sort of a flowery print thing. And it's like, this is our first release, you know, whoopee, you know. Um, so it was that whole do-it-yourself thing inspired by the British scene, the you know yeah. American scene, do-it-yourself, New York, people putting out records, you know, whatever, yeah. self-financing. Just The idea was just to get the stuff out there, people to hear it. I mean, we were the, the, hippies were, the, the hippies to a degree were doing <laughs> that. The hippies were doing that to a certain degree here in the 60s yeah. as well. You know, but also you got to remember that we were... Themselves and stuff. Yeah, you know, we were hated in Dunedin by the music scene, by the older music crowd and the hotel managers. We once played a battle of the bands at the downtown tavern. And we thought, oh, no, what we'll do is we'll do a medley of like three or four songs and we'll say we're going to do one song. So we got up and played four songs and the, the people were just, you know, get them off the stage, get them off the stage, you know. And um, we, we would were all, we we were quite... We were quite confrontational with our music, though we would never hold back. And if we, yeah. I think, and if we felt we came across a situation where we knew we were up against it, we'd be even more unlistenable. We're going to go, okay, well, you're going to really well, fucking get it tonight. Yourself, so we I did think... have quite a bit. Of, we did quite a bit. I had a lot of attitude. That was my attitude. We yeah. had to fucking kill you, you know, roller coaster <laughs> over you, you know. But also, you know, um, the form of what we're playing, it was it was loud and it was sonic and it was different and. There was another uh, pub. I talked the guy into giving us a gig, and we started playing. And they just pulled the parents and said, "Get out of here!" Yeah. <laughs> and now, yeah. you know, and we had to leave. And we had like four people who'd come to see us. You know, I think it was the second we, night, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, Prince of Wales. Yep. Oh, well, the second night. You let us go the first night. I think we got yeah. tickets immediately. I can't remember, but you know, I don't pretty know. much. But there also, a, musos sorry. in town, you know, people who could really play guitars or whatever, they, they thought we were shit, you know. And we used to get written about on the rumours column, like, put down and, you know, we were terrible. And the first gig we did in Christchurch with Peter Gutteridge, you know, before Bob joined the band, we travelled up with the enemy and they dosed us with speed, this thing called No Dose, and got us drunk. So when we turned no up dose. to play at the Forest of Hall, <laughs> we didn't even know what we were doing. We just looked at each other and like, how do you play the guitar again? <laughs> <laughs> You know, and that was it. Oh, that's right, time. I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do I play drums? Oh, that's what I don't. <laughs> yeah, we had a lot of Who's singing tonight? Time. I don't know. <laughs> it wasn't a very good debut. So we had a bad <laughs> in Christchurch. I bust a string. No, I bust a string that night. Oh, I've never done this before. What do you do now? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, it's funny because, like, you, you mentioned, like, you know, like the, the musos, the virtuosos would, like, put their look their, down their noses at you. And I think that's the, the real thing that sets you guys apart from, you know, these bands in America and these bands in England, too, where they're, they have all this sort of, like, rock damage to their approach to this music, where you guys are approaching it from a completely free place. Like, like it's a completely new approach to playing guitar. Like, obviously now it's kind of like incorporated into the musical lexicon but at the time it was must have been very confrontational to people that had woodshedded this these sort of tired old riffs for years and years and here you guys are coming with a completely new approach yeah it's a different form I think we're, just a bit, we're a bit loud and harsh for people i guess the, the guitar but sound the other thing was that the enemy you know we, we were all doing this at the same time like i tried out with drums with the enemy and david picked up the guitar at the same time but alec was just a little bit ahead of them. Like they, they practiced a bit more and rehearsed a bit more, but essentially no one had played these instruments, you know, really like picked them up and we didn't really know what we we're doing. When I first started playing drums, I couldn't even, didn't even know how to use a, a bass drum pedal, you know, and people like, um, oh, I'm just trying to think, uh, Subway Sect, uh, Vic Goddard said, they had the same thing, they bought a drum kit and they looked, got it home and they looked at it and it's like, how does this work? How does this drum kit, actually, you know, how do you make it function? Yeah. So we came from that same sort of uh, point of, you know, starting. And for that, it means that you have a really blank, open canvas. You don't have the sort of conditioned way of, oh, you know, I can play lead guitar like Mick Taylor or, you know, Eric Clapton yeah. or whatever. And it's, it's a different... You know, like I've gone through every blues fucking riff. Yeah, we were, we were we were really, we were really lucky to see some. We were lucky to see some of those acts we saw, like to see Lou Reed. 
and his band. I mean, I think that was uh, Steely Morrison on a rhythm guitar when he came through. No, I don't no, know. That it was I didn't... Your brothers, Doug and. Yes, yeah, that's who. Oh, yeah, the you or the your brother, one of the your brothers. That's right. I mean, to see all that stuff that we saw when we were kids in the seventies and eighties. Those all those bands that came through. I mean, that got in all that stuff. You know, from yeah. Lou Reed yeah. was the loudest thing I ever heard in my life. You know, we it's fantastic. It's fantastic. It was you know, started off with Sweet Jane, and it was just like I felt like I was going to be crushed into my seat. You know. But Brownie McGee, Brownie, Brownie McGee blew my mind as well. His guitar, I've never heard a guitar like that before, uh, that, that point. You know, stuff like that, all that got in, you know. Mm. Split it, ends were also incredibly influential. Sure. To me, I saw them in 75 and um, I just, I couldn't believe it. The, the light show, the costume, yeah. what they were doing, it was just, it was like nothing else in the world, you know. Yeah. At, at the time, it was very, very um, creative and very, I mean, these guys are walking down Dunedin Main Street in 75 with shaved heads, with, you know, hair sticking up and weird coats. And this is, you know, 1975, and it's kind of radical. You know, I, I'd never seen anything like a, a human being look like that, you know, and walk down the streets. With a some, people say, some people say that New Zealand, you know, might be a really backward place, and it always sort of was, but, you know, we did sort of um, put up with the freaks. A lot of, they did the freaks. Oh. You know, do their thing as long as it didn't get out of hand. As long as it didn't get out of hand, you know. <laughs> you also got to look at all the culture that's been created in this colony. Um, there's a distinct uh, art and literature that's, that's evolved in New Zealand. And in Christchurch, for example, there was a, a, a group called the Group. Uh, people like woman artists like Rita Angus, Colin McCarr, mm. all these artists emerged out of this ferment. And it had a peculiar New Zealand aspect to it where people in the colony were at Pākehā, or white people, but also Māori were re-articulating white culture. You know, uh, a Māori carver, who might have been a carver traditionally or doing patterning or drawing, you know, things suddenly as an artist. And then what does that mean as, a, as an artist, you know, representing an artist? Like Ralph O'Terry went to London in the 60s and... There were people here, artists like Gordon Walters, integrating Maori aspects into Pākehā culture, and it was all this. Uh, Colin McCann was, you know, relating to the land and the landscape and the light and all this sort of stuff and the peculiarities of it. And writers like Janet Frame were articulating the experience. She was put into a mental hospital and given ECT because she was perceived as being too strange. So you've got this conservative aspect of New Zealand culture, but then you've got this artistic aspect. Um, in Dunedin, there was a salon, a group of women had a salon in the 30s, you know, you, we, we could go and sit and talk about art and paint and stuff. Uh, and it's interesting. It's like New Zealand has a microcosm of whatever was going on anywhere else in the world. And, you know, uh, we, had, we, we had opium dens in the gold yeah. days. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> probably our, our grandfather's <laughs> Don't uh, forget children that. blew we a did. lot of money in, in the opium dens. <laughs> you make all the money up in the gold fields in the 1860s, yep. you go back to Dunedin and, you know, Love. get it on. Get it on. <laughs> and, 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 and good weed. You know, it's one of the better weed producing countries that I've gotten to travel to. <laughs> <laughs> Exceptional. Very good. <laughs> it, it, it really it really does feel, though, that there's like a, uh, like, it, because, you know, as the, in spite of what you're saying with all these bands coming, but the, but the fact that there wasn't so much like for canada we had so much influence coming from the united states culturally and obviously england as well mm. you know that mm. it it shapes our culture and it still shapes our culture in the way it does but i think you know i, I don't know if it's by virtue of the fact that things take a lot longer you know like in terms of enemy arriving that you guys are able to kind of develop your own thing before getting whatever forced upon you in the same way that we do hey how about backman turner overdrive man Great. Well, no, we have great stuff here. Don't get me wrong. We have amazing I think, stuff. I think, that, I think to all of us and our friends, we were just so obsessed to hear good new music that, you know, any, no matter where it came from, really. But we were quite reliant on people traveling, though, like coming back from overseas and bringing records back. And those records would be shared out or copied or whatever, you know. So that, that was going on all the time as well. There's an amazing scene in that Friends of the Enemy documentary where uh, Shane Carter's outside of a pub talking about the fact oh, that yeah. none of the younger bands can get into the pub and the band's doing a Clash cover. 
and he's like mm-hmm. says something dismissive about the clash of the time were, mm-hmm. was that something that was did you guys feel the same way towards this band like there were like bands that were approaching this thing from like a rock side and there were bands that were approaching this thing from another way or is that just like a personal opinion do you think well, I think at that, that stage we were completely over the idea of being a covers band, like, you know, had yeah. no interest in doing that. And there was still a lot of that going on. There was, will be really, but um, there's definitely an anti-feeling towards that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we were dedicated to making our own music and doing our own songwriting in it. And we started off writing songs and a lot of them were really crappy <laughs> and bad. <laughs> but we, we sort of learned, we self-taught, you know, the, the art of song crafting or creating things. But the thing with the clean that I always sort of stress to people that we weren't just obsessed with songwriting or structured playing. We were very improvisational and um, we would take a piece, you know, Bob and David, when they met, they created, they just jammed and they created at the bottom together in a bedroom. And then, then we would take whatever we did, you know, we, we one time we played point that thing somewhere else for a whole set. We did, that's all we did in Auckland. Mm. We thought, oh, this will be cool. We'll just do that and see what people think of that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'd do that, and we had other pieces of music like quick step and other instruments, instrumental things. And we were always very, um, we had, we're aware of structure and the, how you can put things together, but we're also very aware of where you could go with an improv approach. I think we're, all, I think we're always up for it. Like, hey. Just, just, just do something, you know. Well, the three of us, were e- the three of us were equally always ready to be inspired, you know. And I think that was a big part of it, you know. Hey, come on, let's try something, or let's write Ooh. something. Come on, come on, come on, keep moving, you know. We always get so bored. Oh, not not that song we wrote last week. Oh, fuck, I'm sick of that fucking song. Well, it's you know? horrible. We'd, always, we'd, always, have to, we'd always have to write. We'd always have to write new songs, and that was great. <laughs> we, yeah, we struck that uh, one thing. We struck I, uh, for me when we toured vehicle and we'd written an album and we wrote that album sort of on tour so the a bunch of songs we cooked up and then we took off on tour we went touring worldwide then we recorded we knocked it down in two days and then we went back three out of, yeah or well, three days or whatever <laughs> yeah you know, we probably sat around and got stoned with the engineer you know and listened to it. <laughs> because he was a stoner all the time he was my stoned. god was he what let me yeah, take yeah. down his name but anyway um in that, in that process, I thought, oh, this this could be actually very destructive to us creatively because we're having to play, play these, you know, little pop songs night after night after night, you know. And um, I can remember one time we were playing in Berlin and a, a German, David and I were dancing around after the show, drunk out of our minds, you know, sort of having fun. Um, la, 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 la. And this German came up and says, I don't know why you're clean reformed. I think you're a boring pop band. And I said, Listen here, Fritz. <laughs> We're having fun. So the next day, <laughs> we had to get in the car and drive to Amsterdam to play an in-store, which we played to about 10 people. <laughs> As we were driving out of Berlin, we noticed this, everybody was crashed out because we had a wild night. Uh, I think I was driving, and about 100, 200 K out of Berlin, somebody woke up. I think it was Bob or whatever, and he said, you know that thing flapping on the uh, rear? <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the money belt. It's the money. Oh, yeah. It's got all the tour money in it. <laughs> <laughs> on that tour, we were also touring with the drums and cardboard boxes on the roof because we couldn't afford <laughs> to have a van. So we had to drive ourselves. So we were driving in the in this um, you know, station it started melting. <laughs> with the drums and cardboard boxes on the roof. The Down drums are melting. Far <laughs> barrier, you know, the, the, we had some heavy rain. When we got back to um, London. We just went into the high company and we just threw the <laughs> drums off the roof yeah. on the landing deck and, and ran. <laughs> <laughs> the drums are melting. The drums are melting. Don't look. Yeah. Just keep going. Like everything we did was like, um, you know, it was, it was very sort of, um, we didn't do it easy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, with that, we could have got caught up in being a, a, you know, like a touring rock and roll machine band where we, you know, had roadies and da 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 da, da, da. But No, it don't come easy. The fact that we did it the hard way, always did it the hard way, it actually, <laughs> it has its, you know, payback. It changes your attitude about the way you do things. And um, I still hold most of what I would perceive as my punk ideas or ideals. I still live by them, you know, and it gets me in a lot of trouble with people. 
because uh, other people think, no, you're supposed to behave in certain ways and say, say certain things and do certain things, you know, and when I don't do them, people really get their backs up and, you know, I've been arrested twice in New Zealand in the last two years <laughs> as a result <laughs> of behavior. And um, it's interesting. I find it fascinating, you know. Um, well, you, I never got arrested back in the day, but I have in New Zealand contemporarily, which I, I perceive at the moment, music and the music world, world of making music is on a point of change with COVID because everybody's had to think about things and the way things are being done, you know, and this whole push towards yuppie and money and high real estate and whatever, whatever, and being in a successful person in the media and, you know, having a high profile and everyone's talking about you and, you know, you've got a new video the, the, out. Yep, and, the yuppies are kind of dying now, though. Aren't they going to start dying now, aren't they? Because they're getting old. Well, so that's kind of good. No, no, the other thing is they also lost their jobs. You know, corporations <laughs> yeah, are going under, true. you know. And um, in New Zealand, they're talking about an internal economy where, you know, I'm, I've got a limited, I'm going back to New York in about 10 days, but um, in, in, in Christchurch, um, you know, I spread the money, the money that I've got, I spread it around, I, I spend it locally. Mm. And people who are making things or doing things, you know, you give them a bit of money or a cool place to hang out, a good bar with cool people that play cool music and all the musicians and artists go to this place in Littleton, Civil and Naval, you know, you can be sitting there with Elders Harding having a conversation or, you know, Marlon Williams along with other people and people, you know, who are involved in theatre and someone's making clothes and doing whatever. So in some ways, my life hasn't really changed since the 70s, you know, or since the 60s, where you've got all this alternative culture doing things alongside of corporate yuppie culture. And to a certain degree, that yuppie corporate culture has dominated things and it's dominated the music industry. You know, we've had um, Lord come out of New Zealand and, you know, people have a big deal made about them. And Marlon Williams is everybody's oh you know, mother's favourite. And that's perceived, that mark of success is perceived as being what makes you famous, you know. And mm. sometimes people will come in, there's a store that I've had, the second hand store, and say, you know, are you, are you a musician or whatever? And I say, yeah, clean, I never heard of them, you know. And uh, generationally, they just sort of may, may have mixed, missed the point where we were on TV and we had um, top 20 hits, but they were recorded for, you know, uh, $50 or <laughs> on a four track. And we got videos on TV and we sold a lot of records, but it was because we toured New Zealand a lot and we had a fan base. And people also lied about how many records they were selling in the record shops because they're like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was helpful. And that, meet him. <laughs> no names. <laughs> that, that explains it no because names. when I went over there, those records are not nearly as available as you would think they would be. Like those yeah. records are really hard to find. Yeah. Well, you know, time, it's a long time ago. Yeah. And um, you know, the limited, limited runs of the record, they, they, were, they were pressed to sell, you know. My, our mother delivered our records because we're on tour. They got sent to her and she had to take them down to the record store, you know, boxes of records for a boodle, you know. Yeah. So, like, there goes Mrs. Clean, you know, delivering her boys' <laughs> records, you know. First <laughs> Southern, first <laughs> southern tour, you know? That's the kind of that's the level that we're hey, at. Hey, girl, here's the box. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mrs. Clean. <laughs> Did you get your copy? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's funny because when Jello Biafra was on the show, the last time he was on, uh, I brought up, you know, your scene, you guys have seen. And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, it's amazing how there's this scene and how it's so different. He's like, oh, that's not punk. And it was like a, a very much like the first time I'd ever run into that with him where he was like, no, 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 that's not punk because it doesn't sound punk. But mm. what you're doing is so much more punk than any Sonic could convey, you know, because you guys are making your own sound and you're doing it yourself, yeah. touring Europe in a fucking car with the drums See, on the roof. Where fucking I, think, I, think, I think one thing we realized though, we realized that, you know, um, when we got, you know, going there in the late seventies, that punk was over, that was it. You know, we we're definitely post-punk by that stage. We, we, once we got going, it was like, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be a punk band. We're taking all the stuff from it, but you know, it's over, whatever that was, it's, you know, it was pretty obvious it was over pretty quickly. It's just a word. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's just a word for oh. God's sake, you know? And Joe you Bam, know, we, Bam for, I tell you what, man, I was in New York City for Occupy. And when that 
whole thing dissolved. There was an Occupy sort of thing outside City Hall, and Jello Biafra turned up, you know, and Occupy had been completely open. I'd been at Zuccotti Park. I used to go down there and do guard work, you know, go down at night because I had a young baby, and I'd walk around and patrol <laughs> it to make sure everyone was safe. So after the park was cleared, they had this event outside the town hall or whatever, and guess who's there? Jello Biafra. You know, and suddenly he's part of the Occupy movement. You know what they had next to the fucking stage? A, 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 a walled off area where he sat. So what he was doing, he was behaving like a fucking rock star, sitting in this fucking, you know, uh, separate area and then getting up and talking to what he perceived as the Occupy movement. There were about, you know, 100 people there who probably had no fucking idea of anything about Occupy. And here's Jello Afro suddenly assuming that he's a spokesman. And it's he, might have been, like, he might have been sick. He could have been sick. Yeah. I've got another good story. When I used to sell paintings <laughs> in Soho, they get this. This character assassinates some people. Oh, no, no, I just want to, I just want to <laughs> fucking iron out a few problems with people. Okay, I was selling paintings on the street and I went out to, went out to get a coffee. I come back and I, oh, fuck, there's Michael Snipe looking at my paintings, you know. That's interesting. He moves on. A week later, on the other side of the street, and I'm standing with my paintings on easels. I used to have three easels. And this person bursts through and knocks over all my easels and paintings on the street. And with a leather jacket on. And you know who it is? Patty Smith. <laughs> Patty fucking Smith bum rushed my artwork. She probably, she'd bought it, Michael Stipe had bought her an apartment. She probably thought, who's, who's that douchebag out in the street? You know, is that New Zealand fucking, you know, guy from the clean? Let's, let's fucking show him, well, you know, we're New Yorkers, we're punk rockers. Fuck, you know, Damn. unbelievable. The fucking Damn. bullshit, you know, that exists in the world. And the fucking posing that goes on and people claiming that there's something and fuck, they're not. <laughs> they're not. What they claim to be is just fucking bullshit. You know, you run around saying, you know, you're reading fucking Arthur Rimbaud and you're hanging out with Bob Dylan. That doesn't make you a fucking artist and doesn't give you any credibility. What you, the credibility you gain is what you do and what you say and what you make and how you behave. You yeah, know, oh, publicly or whatever. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's fun for me. Jane County was just on the show the other day and she told the story about when she used to do plays with Patti Smith. And uh, one time Patti Smith was in this play and her only line was, Brian Jones is dead. And then she just pulls out a needle and starts shooting meth on stage. So she's she's a commit, committed to a different kind of art, I guess. Hey, Jane, Jane County is cool. I saw Jane County, Alan Vega, Michael Board, and um, someone else do a thing on 70s music. and. Um, it was fascinating because those people really represent, you know, um, for me, the downtown scene, you know, first and more recounts that the first time he ever saw the cramps and suicide playing at that small club and, uh, you know, New York, he came down from Connecticut, you know, and it just blew his mind because Alan Vega was wrapping his microphone cord around people in the audience. And he said, he'd never heard anything like the cramps before in his life. It just it was like, and he, he and his friend drove back to Connecticut and they didn't talk to each other for an hour or two. And then he just looked at each other and said, what the fuck was that? What was that? You know, and that's mm -hmm. what that scene was. You know, it was like people really doing something that no one had done before. Um, I, I've got nothing but, uh, you know, respect for Alan Vega and Marty Rev. And um, the best thing for me was uh, when I met Alan, Alan Vega at that thing, he said, what's your name, man? I said, Hamish. He says, that's a fucking beautiful name. <laughs> I said, thank that's you, Alan. <laughs> that's all I need to hear, <laughs> you know. Um, so cool. And he also, you know, he would talk about, you know, talk about things to people. It's like Jim Morrison, I think the Doors single-handedly transformed American music because Jim Morrison would get off the stage and walk around the audience and sign autographs and talk to people. Hmm. And, you know, all the chairs were smashed in all the auditorium. So what did they do? They take the fucking chairs away. But people had to sit and watch by the police, you know. Um, that was conservative America. And um, everybody... No, no, Jim Mor no Jim Morrison, no Iggy Pop. Absolutely. Really. Yeah. yeah. For real. Yeah. Hands down. Yeah. yeah. They, they're love kind the, of like the, a... Love the fucking doors. I don't care what people say about the doors, but I yeah. adore I've the doors. I've just been reading... Um, uh, Robbie Krieger's book is great. I'm giving it to my cousin this cool. afternoon. And it's fascinating. You know, he got arrested and, uh, you know, and the doors were practicing in the, their 
parents' living room, you know, his parents' living room. Um, it's just, it's fascinating. And Iggy Pop used to wander around East Village and, you know, you just sort of see him and Johnny Thunders and these people in, in New York City, these guys just hang out in the street. There's no separation between mm. what they do and the people they make the music for. It isn't sort of separate or elevated or removed or mm. restricted or elitist, you know? Well, that's probably why punk really gets going once it hits you like obviously it's starting in cleveland detroit all these different places but like when it hits new york that's when it really starts going because you have that like you're talking about that intersection where these like highfalutin art types are mixing with these like street urchin rock and roll types and and you really mm. have that coming together there like suicide embodies it the fact that suicide and all the stuff that's going on in max is that time where it's like this high art meets low art uh downtown scene mm-hmm London was the same, I guess, too. But yeah, you're right. Wonderful work. <coughs> wonderful, wonderful stuff. I've, I've got a friend uh, in New York who um, picked up Jean Michel Basquet off a park bench in Union Square and took him home for the night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's like this. Day. Well, there's, there's this, uh, this woman, Honeychild Coleman, was on and she was talking about coming to New York and one second you're watching RuPaul DJ and then you perform and then you go down the street and you're watching Basquiat DJ and then you're seeing Gigi Allen perform. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's all happening at the same time in that city somehow. Yeah. You know, it's so cool in New York because I would see um, Jim Jamoosh walking all the time. I would see um, uh, Jonas Mikas, um, Vincent Gallo. And I, I walked up to Jim Jamoosh one day and I thought, I'll, I'll go courage. I'll, and I said, Mr. Jamoosh, you know, I really like your films and, he just said, well, thank you, you know. And we went up to Galo and I said, you know, everyone said, oh, he's an asshole, you know. I said, hey, you know, I really love your films. I think they're fucking great. Thank you for doing them. And he just said, thank you, you know. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, he's, he's amazing. Well, he was in a punk band too, right? The Del Byzantians or Del Byzantine, yeah, yeah. sorry. Mm. And I, I heard this song. I loved it. Their version of Sally Go Around the Roses, you know. They did a great version of that. Yeah, they played at Maxwell's on Hoboken, you know. Their two LPs are amazing. Like, they, they have two yeah. LPs in a single uh on the same label as as chrome too right back then mm -hmm. um and they're just once again like you know not not straightforward in their approach to this thing they're not trying to ape some other band but you can tell that they're coming at this from like a real a real energetic punk place mm -hmm. yeah. um i've kept you guys for a very long time and i, yeah, I, I might have to go <laughs> yeah i should let you guys go back into your <laughs> own lives but uh, i i before i do <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to, I got to say, it's been great fun. Well, I got it. Oh, sorry. I've go really on, please. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's been great fun. Well, I have, yeah. I have managed to keep you forever and not even get through half my questions. So if any of you want to come <laughs> back on and talk, you know, the great unwashed, the bats, the weeds, like any of the amazing mm. shit you guys have been involved in, I would love to have you back and please know the door is always open. For sure, For man. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, the but before door I let... will never be open. The door will never be open. But I, I talk too much. No, Don't no, be... please. It was amazing. But before I let you go, though, I just got to ask you because I'm a record collector and I've been obsessed with this record since I found out about its existence. Did any of you have the Sham 69 Only One split that was only released in New Zealand back in the day? No, did not exist. Right. I don't know, know if it does either. I've never seen a physical copy in my life. I've seen it on the internet, but it is it is one of the great mystery records to me. Well, the only, the only ones records they all got released here. Those first three, I think. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Oh wow. well, Sham sixty nine though. Wow, what an odd coupling. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will be over there in New Zealand hunting for that record and hopefully getting to meet you guys in person or Hamish in New York. And thank you guys so much. And then I'll keep an eye out for that record. And, um, yeah. Uh, at Penny Lane, you know, because a lot of stuff comes through there. They've got a thing, you know, saying rare records flying down wanted, you know. So, hey, you never well, I hope know. You, yeah, I hope you make it to New Zealand and look us up if you do, Damien. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Robert, Hamish, and David for coming on the show. And there is a part two in the works with some of those people already because... <laughs> There's a lot more to get to, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, I, I, I can't wait to talk to him about all this other stuff. The clean, the clean. Oh, that was a, that was amazing. Thank you to Mike for running around trying to make that happen because there was a lot of time zones involved and uh, took a little bit of juggling, but we did it. 
and I am grateful. Speaking about being grateful, I am grateful that all of you have listened to this podcast so much this past year. This has been a uh, big year for the show. A lot of huge guests, a lot of um, a lot of fun. I really had a lot of fun doing this thing this past year. And so as we're kind of wrapping up, I wanted to kind of, you know, put out a couple episodes that maybe aren't as canonical with the rest of the stuff we're doing, but are part of the story. And people seem to like when fucked up stuff comes up on the show. So next week we're going to have some fucked up episodes. When I say fucked up, they are fucked up episodes in the content, but I mean (laughs) involving the band I play in fucked up. Starting it off next week with Josh Zucker from Fucked Up with his own Turned Out a Punk episode. So that is the next episode, and uh, that is it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Remember, as always, Black Lives Matter. The lives of Indigenous peoples matter. We need to protect trans kids and help trans people protect themselves and stop hate and violence towards people that have different faiths or different, you know, ethnicities or nationalities or just just knock all that shit off because this isn't a, these aren't political issues what we're talking about here these are just basic human rights issues these are just people wanting to live their lives and be free and and not have to deal with violence and hatred and discrimination so get involved in organizations that you know are doing good work that you see out there or things that are happening that you support or believe in try and get involved Because that's the only way things change in this world is when people get involved. Speaking of getting involved, sign your organ donor card. Because by the time they come looking for those organs, you don't need them. And I've seen it happen firsthand. It can change someone's life to get an organ transplant. Change someone's life. It can give someone life to get an organ transplant. So sign that card. Uh, Go out there and make your own culture in the meantime. Before they have to come harvest your organs. Because it will enrich your world a little bit. And that doesn't have to be, you know, something as grandiose as, you know, starting a band and changing the course of music history like The Clean. It could just be, you know, just starting a band to make music like The Clean. It doesn't have to be making music. Maybe you just want to draw a picture. Maybe you just want to uh, put out a zine. Start a podcast. Don't start a podcast. Don't. Well, I'll start one. Who cares? Uh, and that's it. Stay safe. Look out for the people around you, um, and I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening.